section. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, what we're dealing with today is the safe driver training protocols post lockdown. So um, it's when we are laid back to work. At the moment, the date is likely to be end of June, beginning of July, but that's still not set in stone yet. It depends on whether we get a spike um, in the coronavirus from the relaxation of this week. So it is still subject to change, but at the moment it looks like end of June, beginning of July. And we've all been, um, really, we've been inactive, most of us, for quite some time. So if we can move on to the next slide, please, Carl. Let's look at the aims of the session we've got. So we're looking at the considerations that you need to take to prepare you to come back um, to work, basically. So it's not just preparing you and thinking you're getting students. You've got to prepare the business. Uh, one big problem that I think that the government admitted was uh, to give industry more notice of people going back to work because uh, many, many companies have said that it was all too quick. So you've got the notice now of being able to do things in the background between now and when you're given the nod to get things organized and start talking to people. So we talk about preparing the business, the risk assessments that um, we all have to face uh, when we go back, how to meet and greet the people in the situation you're gonna be in because coronavirus is not going away. There's gonna be quite some time before um, we are at a level where we are in a safe and a totally safe environment. Lesson planning, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. The personal protective equipment overview and dealing with certain aspects that will take place either from yourselves and your family or from other uh, the clients that you're actually going to be dealing with. So if you can move on, please, Carly. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about preparing the business now. And um, the very first thing to do is to ensure that you and your household are well. Uh, are you fit to work? The, the situation we're in here is that um, the... Um, you still have to protect your household. So if you have people in your household who are in the vulnerable sector with um, underlying health trends, etc., that is still something that has to be done for some considerable time yet. It's not going to happen just because the Prime Minister's waved the flag to say that things are starting to return to normal. So the health check isn't just you physically, personally, yourself being well. Is your household ready for you to return to work? What sort of risk are you going to bring back into the household, which could affect them at a later date? Also looking at the vehicle status, um, you've got to get to wherever you're going safely. And the reason health check and vehicle status are um, asterisks is because we're going to go through it in a lot more detail in a second. But you also need to make sure that um, all of your licenses are in date. I mean, we've all got a, a 10 year administration time on our photo cards. Make sure it hasn't expired because otherwise you're training illegally. Make sure it's all up to date. Uh, ADI badges, PDI badges, for example. Now, I'm going to just broach this now. The, the DVSA are unable to extend time on these badges for the times they haven't been used. Um, and that's because it goes back to the uh, coronavirus regulations 2020. Some laws were allowed to be repealed temporarily, um, and the Queen gave sanction to that when she signed off that, that legislation on the 17th of March. But the Road Traffic Act and the Highways Act, well, the Road Traffic Act 1988, wasn't included. And this is what all our licenses come under, our ADI badge, PDI badge, expiry to, um, uh, sorry, extensions to the theory certificates, etc., all come under um, the 1988 Road Traffic Act or amendments to it in 2005. Oh, so we for a question for a moment. Bobby's yeah. out. The photo is out of date. Is it illegal to go out? Um, it is. The license is valid to the 70th birthday, but the police will pull you up if you're stopped on the side of the road, and the and the photograph is out of date. Um, it. It does have implications on the insurance because you're not driving in accordance with the license. The license regulations are that the photograph must be in date uh, if it's a photocard license. Now, this is a bit of a problem. This is a two tiered problem because the people on paper licenses don't have that problem. But the people who have the photocard licenses 
are open to liability if the photograph is not in date. Okay. And just one other quick question. Uh, Chris Benstead uh, is asking, can we confirm if we are phase three in terms of government guidance of return to work earliest 4th of July, are we still waiting for official guidance? I know some associations are saying you are phase three. This has not been strictly confirmed by government at the moment, so it is open to interpretation still. Um, it is expected or it is thought that you fall into the phase three category that other professions such as hairdressers do fall into. However, there are obviously trainers who are out there now, some of whom are legitimately training key workers and have you know, assessed that risk and are, are prepared to take it to help with key worker training. There are some obviously who are back to training normal pupils. You know, we've got to reiterate, as Howard was talking about legislation there, there is no legislation barring you definitively from delivering training at this time. We have to be honest about that, that fact. Social distancing guidelines are guidelines. And obviously, we ask the country as a whole to respect those. But the reality is there is little that government will do or can do to intervene if somebody is back on the road in training. And we will see this increase over the next few weeks as people make the decision to return to the road. So um, there isn't that definitive guidance at the moment that helps us say one way or the other, you can or you can't go out. And I think if people are expecting there to be that guidance saying you can or you can't go out for sure, they'll be disappointed because the government won't make that particular step. What I think DVSA and us are agreeing at the moment is that we recommend that training is restricted to those with an essential need to learn to drive at this time. Anything else is at the risk and the discretion of the individual driving school. DIA has no jurisdiction to tell people whether they can go out and train. We can only offer advice and guidance and make recommendations. So just to clarify on that one there. And we can talk about this in more detail and take questions later on in the session as well. Why we're giving advice at this moment in time, and some have pointed to this as us encouraging people to go out there, I'm afraid... You won't like the answer, particularly if you fall into that camp. I, as somebody who works in the, in the wider area of public health, feel like many public health practitioners do, that if you simply say no to people to not do something, they don't necessarily follow that guidance and they will go underground and do that thing anyway. I think if we are going to see some people taking these risks, at least if we offer some form of guidance and education, it will help mitigate some of those risks. As I say, we don't have jurisdiction to stop people training. If we can help those people who insist on doing it, if they haven't got you know, a, a key worker and they're just doing the normal training, to do it safely, at least that's some level of risk mitigation. Okay, how if, I can, if I can just clarify what you're saying as well, Carly, the, we've got to remember that post lockdown, we had a norm. We've now got a new norm. And what we're doing here with today is we have a webinar today to help you to, to respect the fact that you have got new risks that you have got to deal with. Some risks you won't be aware of. Now, I'm going to say this one saying to you, which is very, very true and pertinent. You don't know what you don't know until you realise you didn't know it. And what we're hopefully doing today is to push things your way to give you food, food for thought to ensure that if you go back to work, you go back to work safely, thinking of the risks there is to you, what's going to burst your bubble from the outside, and could you burst somebody else's bubble by being a risk to them. And this is really what we're doing at the moment. We've called it post-lockdown, but as Carly has said, it is not illegal for anyone to go back to work. But the thing is there are um, regulations that have been advi advised for you to follow. For example, people in industry, when they have two people in the same vehicle, they are to be the same two people. Um, so a driver and a driver's mate, must be the same two people all week on every shift in order to reduce risk. So there are certain aspects that are put in place. The problem with your vehicle is you are encouraging so many different households to get into your vehicle. And that's the problem we have with the risk that that will produce. So I am going to go through with you now, and it will take a little bit of time, might go over the hour, but I'm going to go through with you now what some of these risks are that we need to bring to your attention.
So and this is really what today's about. And it's also about that fact that whether you choose to go back to work now, in a month's time or in six months' time, there will be some element of risk of contagion or infection, either from COVID-19 or other infectious diseases. So the new normal is about some, because actually some trainers were already taking some level of precautions, but there will be a level that this is your normal life to take a lot of these precautions. And if there is a benefit at all to have come out of the COVID-19 crisis, it is making us more aware of risks and how to mitigate them. So it's not to hold things up a little bit more, but just to answer a couple of questions we've just had, I respect that in Scotland and Wales, there are different forms of lockdown in place. Um, we are trying to seek advice from Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland in respect to driving instruction. Um, I've not heard anything to bar the training of key workers in any of the devolved areas of Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland. Um, but obviously what is classed as an essential journey still and barring of anything that is not an essential journey is different in Wales and Scotland to the rest of England. So where I can get advice on where that differs, we will share that with you. Um, and as the advice changes, you know, this is what's confusing for all of us. Advice Advice changes. There's also been some uh, advice that uh, car sharing is allowed for employees. And I read about that first in, in the Daily Mail, not even in the, you know, in any notes from DVSA. So again, we, we have to seek clarification all the time when a piece of news comes to us. It appears Grant Shapps also said the Transport Minister yesterday that car sharing is allowable because if you want to get people back to work, there is going to be an element of people having to travel together. Um, but all precautions must be taken around car sharing, around cleaning of the car, windows down as far as possible, all those kind of things. So please bear with us in terms of being able to give you guidance at times because we don't necessarily have that clarity from those that we seek it from as well. Okay, go on, go on Howard. Okay, fine. Um, so still looking at the slide, preparing the business. Um, what we need to consider, uh, about obviously with the health check um, for you, you're going to have to have broader shoulders because the situation with um, the people who you're likely to be coming into, uh, or coming into contact will, with, are all have gone through some sort of trauma during this lockdown stage, uh, whether they be frontline staff, whether they be um, people who have lost relatives, uh, family, etc. And one thing you have to be careful of now is, is to be aware of um, all the sorts of um, information that's going to come back at you from others. And one thing you'll be careful of is not to become an agony aunt. You cannot hug these people. So we have to prepare you and the business for what is about to come. So looking at the preparing the business, very first things, a health check, are you ready to work? Are you grieving, et cetera? Um, vehicle status, it's got to be, the vehicle's got to be up together. Licenses need to be all in date, uh, PLPI, insurance, et cetera. Um, have you informed or when it comes for you to go back to work, is there anybody you have to inform to say you are going back? So finance holidays and money holidays all cease and you have to start paying your way again. And look at the costings to your business. You may have to reappraise your charge out rates. And I know a lot of you are saying, well, how the heck can I put the price up now when I'm trying to get people uh, back in the car? The thing is that it's going to be more expensive. A vehicle at the moment, the average car lesson uh, for, for an hour's training, it costs £11.80 to run your vehicle for fuel, insurance, wear and tear, and all the other things that um, costing in of your training aids, etc. cetera, insurance is everything. It costs out at £11.80 per hour. So if you're charging £15 an hour, you're not going to be making any money. You've now got to consider PPE that might have to be purchased as well. And... Uh, you may have to travel further around because uh, there may be less people about who want to learn to drive. So you've got to start now looking at the costs of the charge out of your business, how much it's costing you to actually go out and do this training 
for the risk that you are actually doing as well. So also, you might also be doing less lessons because some of our advice is about spreading the risk by having less time in the car, so less lessons. So you need to be able to cover the fact that you might not be going through the volume of pupils and lessons that you normally would do. And one way of you know, rectifying that differential in your income is to charge more for the sessions that you do do. And Yes, there's an element in risking you doing that, but bear in mind that we're going to go into a situation in this marketplace now where demand might come back to the market and demand will be impacted, obviously, by, by pupil fear of, of, of exposure. So some may not want to learn. Demand may be restricted by the fact we will enter a very recessionary environment. And those who can remember being in the industry the last time, a recessionary environment obviously isn't very good for driver training. However, you might, though, find that in some areas there is demand and the demand is outstripping supply because uh, instructors have decided not to return to to work for the foreseeable or instructors cannot return because they're vulnerable or someone in their family is um, or they're they're actually ill so it's going to be a very uneven landscape for a while and it but if you if you do fall into the pocket where there is demand outstripping supply in your area then obviously pricing sometimes adjusts in markets to take advantage of, of, of that fact so these are all I know it was already a, a blooming confusing time for you guys and you already thought you had a lot to think about. I'm afraid today we're also going to give you more food for thought and not necessarily all the answers. But um, these are the necessary flags we have to raise and get you to think about that as well. Um, Carol, I'm just going to, sorry to interrupt again, I'm just going to skip back to something. There is no specific regulation or legislation that specifies you cannot go out and teach at the moment. And that doesn't specify either in terms of a regulation that you, if you do go out and teach, you must only teach a key worker. It is a recommendation from DVSA that the only people should be trained are those who are key workers and those key workers have to have an essential need to drive at this time or ride. So AGI licenses are still in effect. They haven't been suspended. So by that route, there is no regulation determining you can't teach at this moment in time. The things that the police are able to find people for would be previous to the easing of lockdown in the UK and still in place in Scotland and Wales, choosing to make a journey that is not deemed essential and also for having members of non-members no, non of your household in the vehicle with you. And, and police were drawing on other forms of legislation like public disorder and things like that to actually make the, and levy these fines. Now, if somebody is training a key worker, the National Police Chiefs Council and regional police forces have been made aware and recognise the key worker trainer register. But if a fine is levied, they are also being told by DVSA. A DVSA has communicated to the appeals teams within each regional constabulary that they should be aware of DVSA's advice that key worker training is going on and maybe should consider not enforcing the fine. So if you have received a fine and you are able to evidence you are training key workers with a critical need to learn to drive at this time, you should appeal against that fine at, with that evidence. And it may be, I can't guarantee, because each regional police force will make its decisions, that that fine will be waived. And certainly DVSA have flagged the fact that they are supporting a level of key worker training. So hopefully... That clarifies that, that there isn't specific regulation, either barring training or specifying it's only for key workers. Now, I'm sure some people who are completely vehemently anti any training, even of key workers, would love me to say there is a piece of regulation, but there isn't. And I have to be honest about that fact. Sorry, Howard, carry on. No, that's OK. Next slide, please. OK. So we're looking at the health check, uh, the personal risk assessment now. Um, just have a, a think of what's happened to you uh, before you return, con uh, contemplate return to work and look at the overall picture. Um, the coronavirus, I, I was um, unfortunate to be really quite ill with symptoms of it in the last three weeks. I've got over it now, but uh, although I had the symptoms of it, I was actually tested negative. So it's um, a bit of a strange beast, this. So any symptoms you've had that are um, related to the coronavirus, uh, you need to ensure that you get the medical advice from 111, etc., 
or phone your, your GP surgery to make sure that whenever you want to go back to work, you are completely able to go back to work and still not a carrier of the virus or an incubator of it. Um, you can find more about it from the NHS UK um, uh, link that is on the slide here. Um, you've got to make sure that you haven't been in contact with anyone who's showing symptoms or anyone who's travelled into a high-risk region who hasn't, if they've returned, hasn't been through isolation. Uh, also be careful of everything outside of coronavirus as well, because there's other things that you could have encountered. Um, experiences while volunteering. Some of you have been out and volunteered to do food deliveries, uh, uh, medicine deliveries, etc. And you've come across families that have um, come across their own type of um, problems and you've been drawn into them in some way. Uh, or are you actually suffering from your own anxiety, uh, grieving from, for a loved one, um, sheltering uh, members of family who are vulnerable in that vulnerable sector and worried about bits and pieces that are taking place? So you have to be aware of your own well-being before you go back and ensure that if you go and expose yourself out to the market in terms of um, the people that come to you for training, that you really do vet them and make sure that there's nothing that you can take back into your own household and nothing you can take from your household that can actually cause any problems to any people you come into contact with in your vehicle. So there is a bigger picture to look at. And we, we're calling that the safety bubble. You must try and keep a safety bubble around you all the time. So you don't pierce it outward and no one pierce it, pierces it inward towards you. So it keeps everyone in, on a safe safe netting. If we can go on to number six, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. I'm just going to quickly answer a question that somebody has uh, yeah. asked, which is, um, if an ADR takes a break until the vaccine has been approved, obviously that's your own decision making there and, and, you, and you take the risks on the flip side of that about being out of work. Um, knowing it could be a while before they could go back to work, do you still have to declare this to the DVSA, especially with a view to redoing your part three in, and, or requalifying? I would, my, our best advice would be yes, if there is any significant um, change to your ability to train and it, this could not be non-covid related you could have to take time out to be a carer or you know or maternity leave or things like that um make sure that you inform the dbsa so they are aware of those changes in your status in terms of being an operational adi we don't know at this moment about having to requalify after a large gap it's normally um a longer period of four years but um we will check on that specific question for you. And just quickly, Michael, do key workers have to have a test book? That is the recommendation of DBSA. We are obviously also seeing trainers who are training people who do not need a test and do not need a license change because they're already full license holders. But DFT, DBSA are completely aware that our members are delivering training to people who need refresher training or driver development, but they already have a license. So it is not the case that they are going to punish people who have got pupils, key worker pupils, who don't have a test book. They agree that if somebody is a road risk because they're increasing their amount of driving for work, but they're already a full license holder, or they're having to drive vehicles they're unfamiliar with, it is better to balance that road risk and have some level of training going on. And obviously, DVSA are also aware, as we are, of fleets that are resuming training or continue to train in, throughout this period and their people aren't going for driving tests there but they're, they're aware of it so hopefully that should clear that one up for now ppe questions we'll go on to ppe as another section so uh just wait for that one for now sorry howard carry on okay so we're talking about your vehicle status now it's uh, sort of a health check of the vehicle really um is your vehicle ready to be used um it could be left idle for quite some time is it going to start Make sure it's clean, um, it is reliable, etc. that it's clean, um, it is um, taxed, insured, etc. Some people have gone through the situation of while they've been on lockdown of changing the insurance from a training insurance because they're not using the vehicle to social, domestic and pleasure. Just make sure you get that reverted back to business insurance again when you start training and, and don't forget to do that. Otherwise, you're training illegally with a vehicle that's not properly insured for the purpose. Um, the cleaning of the vehicle, the sanitation of the vehicle, 
all of the contact points need to be um, cleaned thoroughly. And what we mean by the contact points, we're looking at uh, the door handles inside and out, uh, any switches for windows to get them up and down, the steering wheel, the horn, the stalks either side of the steering wheel, the handbrake or parking brake, uh, gear levers, uh, any switches at all for venting and heating, um, the seat belt, the buckle, the fasteners, the uh, lever that you pull to move the seat forward and back, anything at all, the head restraint where people rest their head, anything that is a contact point has to have uh, has to be sanitized and cleaned before somebody else gets into your vehicle. Once you finish the session with them and you move on to the next one, the vehicle has to be cleaned again um, before you start driving it to that next session. And then again, when you get to the next client, if you've got somebody following on, has to be cleaned again before they get in. So you've got to build time into your regime to do this and also um, possibly be in, in a safe place where you can do it as well so you can dispose of all of the wipes and any debris you've got from cleaning the vehicle so it's not staying in the vehicle to make sure it can go into a bin. But all the contact points do need doing, and it's going to be a lot of cleaning. You need to get those products and make sure you have them at hand to be able to sanitize the vehicle for every change of driver when you're doing when you are doing your training. It would also be advisable that once you start training, especially um, for the near future when you first start training, is that if it's possible to avoid any members of the family from driving your vehicle. So you're sanitizing it and keeping the amount of use of change of drivers down to an absolute minimum. You'll also need to drive round with the window slightly open so that ventilation, try to avoid using the um, air conditioning and certainly do not use the recycled air mode on your ventilation. Howard, so, yeah. um, would you include the seat as a contact point and how practical would that be a, a number of times a day? So cleaning the seat down as a point of contact as well and uh, those kind of issues. Yeah, if it's, uh, if it's a sort of plasticky type uh, ones that have got a, a wipe down surface, indefinitely. But um, uh, what you might want to do is to put a um, covering over the seat and after the driver's got out, take that covering off and change to another one if it's a cloth seat because you're not going to be able to keep wiping that down all the time without it becoming damp and then becoming uh, uncomfortable to sit in, in the first place. Um, somebody just mentioned that uh, in professions such as uh, beauty and hair, the Institute of Aesthetics, which is one of the uh, associations in their space, is producing a back to work course. All of these slides, the slides that we produced for the key worker trainer course, which was a, cert you know, a certified course, essentially, will be put into a post lockdown uh, kit. So we will be having an online course available now to those, not right now, so don't jump the gun and start emailing Howard that he hasn't done it this second, um, but in the next few days, um, we'll be put out to people who are not doing key worker training to prepare you for your return to work. And yes, I can make that a certified course um, if people would like to receive a certificate for that as well. Um, as Diamond is an accrediting body and DIA is acknowledged as, a, as an educational body as well. So we will put all of this together in a package for you um, as soon as we're confident we've got all the information that we need. Obviously, that, again, will be an evolving piece of work. You'll have to, as, as we're doing this week with our key worker trainer registrants they are receiving updates on their course as we get updated information so those who take the course will receive refreshers of it as we go as a five -five carry on okay change change slides please sir carly if you will okay so before you leave home these are the daily checks you need to do on your vehicle this is a standard thing you should be doing anyway as an ADI, whether it's lockdown or not. So just to remind you of the things you need to be checking on. Remember your vehicle hasn't been used for a while possibly, and therefore we've got to make sure that all this is working. Uh, we have got the um, relaxation with MOT certificates at the moment, although the police advise that if a vehicle is being used for business use, that the MOT, if it is currently expired, is put in for MOT at the first opportunity. 
Um, the government brought this out a few weeks, a good few weeks back, but then very, very quickly rescinded part of it and said that with commercial vehicles that tow trailers, although the Patacnican or the, or the tractor unit doesn't have to have the MOT at this moment, the trailers do. So um, they are alert to the fact that in the first opportunity that a vehicle can be MOT'd, despite the MOT holiday, it must be MOT'd at the first opportunity it can be done so if it is currently, um, if the MOT is currently expired. Okay, so all of what you've got on this floudery here all comes under the construction and use regulations, um, which is what makes up the MOT. So ideally, we need to make sure that the vehicle is in a safe condition. Howard, um, or, just yeah. quickly, obviously got to respect my, our motorcycle members. So they obviously have bolts and powders as well. And, yeah. um, and rider members, um, we've produced some joint guidance and we'll continue to do so with MCIA. If you're an ATB owner, you should probably receive the, the policy that we jointly produce together. But we will produce a training course. What's happening with us and MCIA now is MCIA is going to look more to be a kind of standards body. We're working with them to provide, be more of the training provider to the individual rider training and about you know, rider training bits rather than the running of the business. So we will produce with them a, a an updated version of, of this specifically for riders. So don't feel ignored. We're very conscious of your needs and the fact that you'll do some things differently to obviously your car training colleagues. Yeah, I mean, it, go, it that goes without saying really. Of course, the, the, the motorcyclists will check all their machines and et cetera before um, they drive on and guys with vans will have a slightly different um, vehicle checklist as well. But uh, generally, vehicles need checking daily and these are the sort of things that need to be checked, including the, the person who's driving the vehicle. You have your own well-being, as we mentioned before, to uh, be considerate of as well at the same time. If you could um, change the slide, please. Yeah. So I mean, again, Howard, can I just check because people want this clarification. Now, it is in my interpretation there is not a specific piece of legislation that bars you from delivering driver training at this time. Sorry to keep Lavi's point, but obviously I'm still getting questions on this. Um, are any laws broken in this process is, is one of the questions I'm seeing flagging up now. Where the police are levying fines, and this is a risk that they will levy the fines and they will enforce the fines. It is under separate legislation for things like, as I said, public disorder um, and, and and Howard's far more savvy than I am on what these could be. But what I'm attempting to do is rather than just take my word for it, I, I'll speak to the National Police Chiefs Council and get updated guides, because obviously guides has changed as of Sunday around the fact that you're now allowed in England to go on a, on a longer journey. Um, so they're, they're not as likely to be levying fines for non-essential journeys under the powers they had before. Um, so please let me seek that clarification. But in terms of the regulation, the regulation has not been amended for how driver trainers ch uh, train and what they do. It's just around those powers given to police to levy fines. The registrar has said that if there is a fine and it is enforced, clearly she will consider that as improper conduct, but she, as she would with any motive of conviction. So if you do get a fine, notify the registrar because she also considers it misconduct, non-notification of motoring convictions. Um, so, and things like CCJs as well. So, but they are, the DVSA have assured us they will take a view on each case given the circumstances. Now that is not a carte blanche to assume they will waive any of these considerations and you won't get a, a letter from them, but they are going to take a more lenient view than would normally under the circumstances. Any notification to the um, registrar must be done within seven days. Yes. And are you yeah. undertaken when you made your registration and when you update your registration, you make that declaration in your forms that you will inform the DVSA of any, you know, kind of these pertinent issues like motion convictions, CCJs, all those kind of things. So this is why they will sometimes take a very dim view and call it misconduct if somebody does not declare motion convictions and they find out first and have to come and ask you about it. OK, so if you could move on the slides, please. Yeah. So, again, another slide that's entitled before you leave home. It's just the coming out of isolation. Um, we don't want to cause a spike with the coronavirus, despite we've got the fact of um, a little bit of a, a reprieve in some of what were uh, quite stringent 
uh, restrictions on us. But uh, we've got to be we're going to be excited to be on on the move. But we've got to make sure that we do uh, certain checks and that before we start going out, clean the vehicle inside and out, um, as you may not be the only driver. So straight away, that vehicle has to be in, in a pristine clean condition before you even go to the first client. Um, and although your family don't show any signs of coronavirus, they can still be a carrier. This is another reason why this vehicle has got to be clean. Um, so you need to consider who's going to drive this vehicle, not just you know with you and your family, but also the, the clients that you actually get to. So the vehicle has got to be kept clean all the time. And it's one of the mindsets. I know we all say we used to keep the vehicles clean when we were doing a training before. This is cleaning it to another level. So if you'd like to move on, please. Yeah. And we talked about the sanitation earlier on. I jumped out a little bit, but these are the points of contact for a car that you would need to do. I've got motorbikes to follow in a second for you guys on bikes. That will come up in a minute. So um, the health check is uh, all the door handles. It's all the contact points, basically. Door handles inside and out. Uh, grab rails, that's for vans, basically. Um, window controls, door mirror controls. Seat adjustment controls, seat belt buckle and clasp, steering wheel, steering wheel adjuster if there is one, indicator and wiper stalks and the horn, gear lever or handle parking brake and the interior mirror, bonnet catch, that's internal and external because you've got to look under the bonnet for your fluids, other controls such as sat nav, ventilation, wind emitters, and where necessary tachographs, includes tachograph cards, but also the key. I mean, there's so many people handing that key that must be kept clean as well. But for goodness sake, do not soak it in sanitizer because obviously you get liquid inside the key, you're going to have a problem. So it's got to be done with a moist cloth uh, that's just barely damp that has got um, the materials in it for sanitizing the, the key. Don't immerse it in anything at all, obviously. So if you'd like to move on, please. Yeah. So for motorbikes, um, this is the details that we have of the sanitation of the actual vehicle. Um, so it's the, the left grip, the clutch lever and switches, any switches are on that left hand grip, the right grip, front brake and switches, any switches on the right hand grip, the headstock, speedometer and dashboard key, well we call it a dashboard, but it's obviously where the, where the speedometer and the any, any other dials you've got all needs wiping over as well. The fuel cap, uh, tank, saddle, the fuel tap, because that's obviously turn on and on, side stand, uh, kick stands, foot rest, center stands, so the kickstart is footrest, center stands, rear brake pedal, or and uh, or if it's a moped, the rear lever. Um, and the kit, it's difficult to sanitize the kits. What has been suggested, uh, I believe by the MCIA, is that um, protective equipment that is provided to people doing CBT, et cetera, should be rotated. But that's a very, very expensive thing for um, a motorcycle body to be able to supply loads and loads and loads of kit. Um, it's also recommended that the kit that's used is actually uh, cleaned with um, the appropriate spray and left for seven days before it's used again. Again, that makes it ever so expensive. What is now generally more accepted is where possible that as the client has got to have protective equipment for riding the bike anyway, that they get that before they come for any training and you advise them on what to get you're not putting a cost burden on your training because they have to get that, that equipment um, to some level to protect them. I mean, there's varying levels of protection, but whatever they need for the speed of their machine and the exposure they put themselves to could be advised by you because they're gonna have to get it anyway. That would take a lot of cost burden off you, um, off the motorcycle trainers, um, and also would um, also reduce the amount of kit that's being used. Helmets are the probably quite difficult to clean in some respects. Sanitizing of them, um, the inside cradles have to come out, but make sure you know which way they come out because they are difficult to get back in again. Um, be very, very careful of the polymer on the outside of the helmet and seek advice from the manufacturer as to what is the best liquid to use for that because there's so, so many um, detergents, etc., which affect the uh, polymers on the um, on the helmet it's on the outside of the helmet so to be very very careful how that is cleaned so um, that's the only advice we can give for motorbikes the MCIA I believe has more information so moving on please 
Um, we're going to be doing a webinar for um, rider trainers specifically next week, uh, folks. I'm just waiting for those who will present it uh, to come back to me with confirmed dates. Uh, but yeah, we're going to do something jointly with MCIA, hopefully. So watch out for that. OK, so moving on to risk assessment now. And basically, what is risk assessment? Well, it's very simple if you think of it this way. It's popping the bubble. There is a lot of danger around you and you have to have a safety zone around you. Very much like we do in the car when we explain to or on the bike when we explain to the, um, the clients we're training that we need to ensure that we know what's in the environment and that we treat the environment in a safe manner. So we're looking at scanning and planning and driving at the appropriate speed for the conditions and surfaces, etc. That helps our safety bubble. So what we're looking at here in this system, in this uh, situation now with risk assessment is um, how much danger or threat is there surrounding my environment that could penetrate that safety bubble? Now, that threat could be you to somebody else. So you could burst the bubble from the inside. So this is where we have to go back and look at the family members. Are we harboring people who are at a very high risk of uh, contracting coronavirus, we need to protect them still, and that's going to be for some time to come yet. Um, or is it a situation where people we're coming into contact with who could be um, on the front line of uh, the wards in the hospital that are key workers that need to um, be able to get a safer method of getting to work because they are so critical to their role that um, they actually have a risk getting to work by using public transport and they're being urged to use a motorcycle or to start learning to drive. That's what the key worker things normally are. So we have got to make sure that we understand um, who we are protecting and what risk we put ourselves to and expose ourselves to as to what we can take back into our own household or spread to others in our own vehicles. That's what we're calling us. If you can think of it as the bubble, that's what we're looking at. So you've, you've heard the saying, the new norm. Well, we've got to forget, pretty much forget, a lot of the procedures we used, apart from the coaching procedures that we had prior to lockdown. Um, and consider that we've got to keep our business and ourselves safe, taking into consideration that we post to others. So, I mean, recapping what we said on the slides already, that we're preparing the business, licenses, insurers, et cetera, et cetera, that's a risk to us that can burst the bubble. Our health check, are we vulnerable to C19? Um, anxiety levels, uh, worries about money, et cetera. Or is that a situation that can, that can burst the bubble? Can it cause us a problem that can prevent us from working or stifle how we work? And the vehicle status, roadworthy, clean, um, is it, should it still be available to the family from now on in order to be careful of the risk that you're putting the environment, uh, the environment you're moving into, you've got to assess that risk all the time. So if we now move on to the next slide, please. Yeah. So you've got to validate yourself now, okay? Um, again, we've got the same link. So I'm not apologizing for showing you the same slide that I showed earlier on, but it is very, very important that you validate yourself just prior to going back to work and thinking back the couple of weeks before that you have had enough time for any symptoms of coronavirus that you may have had or people you've come into contact to, are you still incubating or harboring that virus that you could give to somebody else? Could you burst the bubble somewhere else? Okay, so we've really still recapping and, and looking at the situation of our environment. If you can move on, please. So we're now going to the risk rating. This is a very simple uh, risk analysis. There's a, a project I'm working on at the moment that Carly is aware of that will come out really quite soon, um, which will be a little bit more in depth of the risks we've got to look at. But if you look at the four levels here of, of one being the very, very serious risk, um, going to a moderate risk and then consider carefully who you train or the environment behind you, and what's minimal risk. If you move on to the next slide, Carly, we've then got a breakdown of what the serious risk category is. So this would be where the trainer's bubble could burst out if the trainer is living with high-risk family members, is unwell or comes into contact with someone who is unwell or returned from abroad without being isolated or quarantined. That trainer should never leave the house. 
Um, the outside risk factors. Bear in mind, yeah. is advice. It's not a diktat. So you have to assess your own risk and make your own decisions accordingly. We're giving a framework with scenarios and context, risk ratings and advice. But obviously, you have to make your own decisions about what you do with this. Well, in, the, in this instance here on, on the trainer bubble bursting out, that is the remit that the NHS has given about mm. people who are at the at-risk category. They should be yeah. dealing with 111, et cetera. So really, they should be isolating. So in that situation, um, that is really what the NHS has said. That is the scenario that the NHS has given. So that would be a situation where a trainer really, it, it, to the, really shouldn't be doing any training, really, for their own safety. Um, the outside risk factor of the person that you come into contact to, um, if they did leave the house uh, and they had a client that's C19 positive or showing symptoms has been in contact with someone who's unwell, returned from abroad, etc., then that client should not be should not be trained anyway. So that's your serious risk. If you are in a situation where you are uh, where the bubble might burst out in this situation, or you're coming into contact where the bubble could be burst by the other people, then no training, you shouldn't leave the house and that person should not be trained. It's as simple as that. If we now go on to the next slide, it will show the risk rating again. So just look at that again and just, just reappraise the levels we've got there and then move on to the next slide, please, and look at the moderate risk. So the moderate risk is where training is living with high risk family members, all of whom are well. So. They might be high risk, but they've had no problems. They're adhering to the um, exercise regimes and the contact regimes, etc. Then in that situation, you might consider doing some training, but you've got to consider what, how, how your bubble could be burst by them. So, for instance, if you get a call from someone who is frontline medical emergency, who are on the wards exposed to C19, then although your family are well, they are still at the high risk area and therefore you would decline to train that client. You would pass that, put that person possibly on to an ADI who is on the voluntary register who can train the key workers because the people on that register are the ones who are not harboring people at risk, who are generally well um, and are in a different well-being state than what your family are. Although they are well, the risk is there because they actually come into the at-risk category. So in this situation here would be a moderate risk. That's the sort of moderate risk we'll be looking at. As I said, there is a, a more comprehensive thing of this, which will be coming out fairly soon to you. If you move on again, please, Carly, we've got the risk rating. Again, Dar just look at... Dara makes a good point. Did you put never on one of the other slides about never leave the house? Because uh, obviously we can't dictate that people never leave the house. <laughs> That's not our jurisdiction. No, OK, fair enough. I mean, what we're saying here is it's a serious situation if you do. That's what we're saying, really. We're sort of reading between the lines. Here, really. about we can't necessarily tell people exactly what to do. We can only advise. But um, bear with us, people. This is a fluid document we've only just started working on. And, and obviously, we're doing something that the government isn't providing with you or nor is anybody else at the moment in time. So it will not be a perfect beast immediately. And it will always need evolution as we find out more and learn more about where risk is and how to manage it. But do point out where we've got things wrong or or it seems a bit you know, uh, questionable because we want feedback from people um, as to, to what we produce. Right, OK. okay. Next one. Move on, move on, please. OK, so we're looking again at the, at the uh, levels again. OK, just to reiterate what they are. And if you move on again, please, Carly. So we're now looking at level three. Again, the trainer is living in a household of no creatures. Uh, key or critical workers, all household as well, has been adhering to distancing regulations and exercising regime. So really, that's sort of a normal household. So again, you consider your clients. But again, if you then get asked by a client who's frontline medical emergency, who's the same one we had before, then that would be a moderate risk as to whether you train them, because they may be working with PPE on their line of work, but they are still exposed to the virus to some extent. And therefore, the moderate risk as to whether you would take that client on, despite the fact that, you know, you then look at the risk of what would you bring back into the house? Your people in your house are all well. Um, there's not really anything to worry about there at the moment. So you've got the chance of being able to train the person, although they are frontline workers, um, you've, you'd, you'd be under a moderate risk if you were to train that person. You could always move them on again. 
to the um, person who's on the voluntary register for key workers if need be. But you could consider training this person yourself. When the uh, risk assessment is uh, framework is, is published, um, and obviously, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. So bear with us on when we can publish this. And um, there will be a, uh, as well as what the risk rating is and, and saying to consider carefully, we will give specific advice for that scenario as well and reiterate the advice around the precautions and protocols you should take or we'll cross-reference you to the specific advice in our other training protocols. Yeah, that's all been built in so far as, as where we've got to it so far with the project. That's, yeah. that's all under, yeah, it's all on the go. Yeah. OK, so if we move on to the next slide, please. And this is just looking at the risk rating just to remind us of what they are. And then we go number four. So we're now looking at, um, again, the trainers living in a household of no key or critical workers. Everyone's well, distancing regimes, etc. So in that respect, there's minimal risk of the trainer taking anything out of the household. Um, the cl client has been adhering to lockdown procedures and exercising regime, etc. and lives in a healthy, in a healthy household. So in terms of bursting each other's bubble, the risk is minimal. And that way, that sort of person, it, I, I relate that to the dairy maid. If you go back many, many, many years ago, every bloke wanted the dairy maid as his girlfriend because That's she had to be I'm absolutely not, clear. I'm trying to worry what the risk of this particular terminology is going to be. So the situation is, this situation here is the cleanest you're going to get, basically. Um, so there's minimal risk to you in this situation. Okay. So yeah. we move on now to the yeah. next one. Analogy, please, people. Why don't we manage the risk of Howard, I'm afraid? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the next one. So meeting and greeting. So whenever you go back to work, um, you've now got a plan. Um, you get the phone call, but you've still got to plan everything to do with the client you get the phone call from. And the very first thing you've got to do is to have a conversation with them by phone. Don't do it by contact or by phone. Um, explain the regime of the cleanliness that um, you would like the client to go through before they come to the car and or, or to, the, to the machine. Uh, and also um, what you will put in place as well. And also that Bear in mind, some of these people you'll be going back to you've seen before, there has been a lull in proceedings and therefore you would be advised to recheck their driving licenses. Um, get them to give you a code, which they need their national insurance number for. They can go to the gov.uk website. Um, it's very clear on how to get the codes for uh, them to pass on to you and check that license within 24 hours of meeting that pupil again, but you must find out their well-being. Now, this is why I mentioned earlier about agony aunt um, situation you're in, where um, you know they have gone through some trauma, uh, may have lost family, could have been volunteers themselves somewhere else, um, and they're all going to have a story to tell. And um, you know, some of those stories will will tell some hardship. But one thing you can't do, you can have empathy for them. But what you cannot do is you cannot hug them and say, oh, well, I'm so sorry to hear all that. You know, those sort of things we could never do anyway. But in the view that there's been a lot of hardship and heartache around through this whole sorry situation we're in, um, the heartstrings do go out to a lot of people. So you've got to be careful that when they come into the um, into the vehicle, they are coming into a learning environment. Um, the new norm is that the place has now been sanitized. There's going to be people on the roads who have, have been afforded more space prior and have done some daft things because they've had more space and perhaps not adhered to um, speed limits where they should do and not driven to conditions where they should have done. Have they changed their behaviour yet? That's an exposure that your student or your client is going to be put to. These are some of the things that we've got to make sure that they are concentrating in a learning environment. So any distractions they have, whether it be emotional or any other form of distraction, has to be put to bed before they start doing the training. So if they are grieving, it might be that they need to have more time before they return to the training regime, to the training environment. Howard, and you'll have to, yeah. Quick, quick question from Chris Benstead. Obviously, mm -hmm. 
you're just a troublemaker most of the time. Um, no, it's a valid uh, point that Chris makes as usual. Um, <laughs> the scale that, he, that we're using is a typical risk management and risk assessment one using a traffic like system because obviously it's very easy for people to grasp the red, amber, green. Chris is suggesting, however, that do we make the risk rating echo the government COVID scale where it's going at grades uh, one to five, where five is the worst level of risk and one is the lowest. So it may be a consideration that we reflect the government uh, risk grading for COVID one to five and do it that way, or we use a traffic light system because in, in lots of areas of risk, traffic light systems are used because they're easier for people to grab. Yeah. Well, so thanks, so Chris. When I mean, the thing is, I mean, Chris is always helpful with with feedback anyway, and um, and we generally get a lot of uh, of good information from you, Chris. Thanks ever so much indeed. Um, the situation is, this is a, a living, breathing document at the moment, and you're putting out there that you think it might be helpful to be in a different format. Then, if we can get some feedback like that, the information in the document won't change. What is risk is risk. How we mark it up. Well, we'll mark it up whatever you understand as being the most simplest way of interpreting the risk. If you want traffic lights, we can do traffic lights. If they want one to five, we can do one to five. But what we want to do is produce something that is useful to you, to, to every, every person that's out there, because there is um, a risk. We are moving into a new norm. The environment is going to be strange to us, and we need to let you go over that threshold as easily as you can with as much confidence and competence as you can so that your clients you take on straight away get into a learning environment that is going to be value for money for them and is going to be um, you know, learning is going to take place so we'll set this out how you want us to so as you we've got I don't know how many people we've got on here at the moment let's have a quick look we've got 161 attendees there's 161 people that can feed back on this today if they want to and let us know what they think they want if they want to put it in the in the chats or want to put it in uh, somewhere on here to let us have a good idea we will set this out as you want it as i say the meat and guts of it will be as we've written it but how you want it scaled if whatever way is going to be easy for you to understand just have your feedback question is if you would see that a traffic light system is easier for people to grasp the concept of, of what the mm -hmm. level of risk is red mm -hmm. and green or you think using the government scaling of one to five um is the best way of doing it just pop it in the chat button so we can take a bit of uh, feedback and obviously when we put out the the the, the rate risk framework we'll we'll survey people on what they think of that and change it as as we learn more as well someone suggested the nando piri piri scale might be more effective for uh, a lot of people because it's what they uh, relate to more these days okay whatever whatever okay let's have, the, let's have the feedback give us the feedback and we can work from that that's the best thing okay okay all right so i'm starting to see that feedback so we'll, we'll come back to that at the end of the session so I, uh, do i yeah. move on howard Sorry, say again. Do you want me to move on the slide? Um, no, I just want just one thing I want to say at the end of this meet and greet slide here um, is to just make sure that um, you know the new norm is going to need concentration and your vehicle must be a learning environment. So just be careful that the, the students or the people you've put back into your vehicle haven't got too much going on. They're trying to deal with too much with money debts and God knows what else. Uh, make sure they are up for learning. OK, move on, please. Licence checks can be done through um, the link I've got on the slide there. Um, so you get the student, the, the client to uh, produce a code from that link. Um, they will need the last eight characters of their driving licence um, and also their national insurance number as well. I believe they have to have two. And the code lasts for 21 days. But you let them give you the code, but you need to check that licence within 24 hours prior to taking them on the road. Um, they may have gone out and done private practice and got points on their license, et cetera. Um, they may have done all 101 things, but um, because there's been a lull since you last saw them, it's very, very pertinent that licenses are checked again before you get them into the vehicle. You do have to manage the risk, and therefore you do need to know that license is still valid and belongs to that person still. That does mitigate the risk under your um, uh, standards checks, Etc. So, uh, and the um, the National Driver and Rider Training Standards. 
So we do have to make sure the person we've got in the car should be there. The, so um, move. Yeah, the DVLA have warned, though, that any new license applications will take time for, for things like provisionals. And, uh, and actually, we can expect that when we go back to testing, that, you know, kind of it might take, you know, a lot of things are digital now, so it's easier. But DVLA at the moment, because of the crisis, are prioritising medical licences and vocational licences. So if you've had a pupil apply for a provisional and they've still not got it, I'm afraid that's the situation that we're in at the moment. Yeah, it's going to take a number of weeks for that backlog to, to be sorted, unfortunately. And there's not anything we can do about that. OK, so um, again, I'll show a slide again check the clients before um, give them a phone call make sure they are their well-being is okay and if you feel that there is uh, symptoms and recommend them to go to the nhs uk um, request the pupil washes their hands thoroughly before you know if you are going to meet them the time that you set that um, they wash their hands thoroughly before they come to the vehicle but don't let them get into the vehicle immediately once you meet them outside keep the social distancing around the vehicle and again, have a chat, explain what you're going to be doing. Keep as much conversation out of the vehicle um, before you let them get in and set the set the controls up, set the vehicle up um, and ensure they put gloves on just before they get into the vehicle. Face um, coverings is optional, really. Uh, the situation with those is um, you must make sure that you can be clearly understood with the directions you're going to give. The recommendation by when having somebody is sitting in a car where social distancing cannot take place is that you face forwards and do not turn and face the person sitting next door to you, especially if you're not wearing a um, facial covering. So whenever you do give any instructions, you look at the windscreen. It's not normally the way we do it, but in this um, C19 situation we're in, the recommendation is that you face forwards and whenever you are trying to explain anything or going through a coaching session with discussion that again the um, pens are not shared that the training aids are not touched by the client um, and that if they have to write anything down they have their own pad and their own pen um, just make sure that there's nothing can be uh, nothing that doesn't have to be made contact with by the client isn't made contact with. OK, so uh, you need to set that regime up. This is the new norm that we need to go through. So next next slide, please. So um, so we call the, uh, the, the, the client before. Don't handshake. There cannot be any contact at all. Ask them to wash their hands with sanitizer immediately before the session. Um, that you will be keeping windows open and that they must wear the appropriate clothing to keep warm. You can put the heating on for them, of course, but you will have to have the windows open. Just bear in mind that if they are too hot or too cold, that does become a distraction to them. So you may have to pull over and let them adjust, uh, adjust their dress somewhat. Um, vehicle will be sanitized before they get in. And um, if you can avoid using cash, uh, it might be a good idea to do so as this is also known to um, possibly be a spread of the virus. Other methods are available to do it where you can do it electronically or backs or or whatever. I, but, also, um, I also would say managing your risk going into the economic environment that we're about to go into, and I've always tried to advise and steer people to this, would be to try and get payment before the first lesson rather than lying on cash being delivered in the lesson and also I think people need to think now more seriously if they haven't done before about asking pupils to commit to a minimum number of lessons because you guys need to head your risk of where your income is coming from it's been a very sobering time for those who lived hand to mouth and had no contingency funds at all um, so I would recommend strongly that people who are taking on new pupils are looking at a minimum and some of that being paid at least up front you also need to look, as we'll probably say later on, and actually we'll develop the business guidance slightly separately to this, because uh, it, 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 it's, it's an important topic. Uh, terms and conditions are going to need to obviously be altered to reflect the fact that your your landscape now is going to suffer from lots of late cancellations from either you or from them. So terms and conditions should uh, should look at that too. But if a pupil's, you know, kind of you know, having to cancel at the last minute, you want to make sure that you don't lose that fee for that if you want to levy a fee for late cancellations. 
Yeah, obviously you've got to have a little bit of leeway there as to what the cancellation is for. You know, in this day and age, people are still dying and you could get a situation where, you know, you will get short notice cancellations and you'd have to give benefit of the doubt in some instances. But it would be advisable to um, just appraise a situation that although you may have terms and conditions that um, when we said this right at the very beginning when the lockdown started, when um, people were asking and saying, what should I do? Well, with terms and conditions, really, it might be advisable for you to, to ex just have a, another conversation with the client on the phone and say that the terms and conditions you originally started with, you can appreciate now that we're under a force majeure, that we've got to um, just reappraise those terms and conditions and then have a chat with them and what they agree with, with um, times, amount of time given for cancellation of lessons, etc., ought to be reappraised verbally at this stage, really until you can get something else in writing to them. Okay, shall I move on? Yeah, move on please, yeah. So again, just reiterating that once you arrive to pick up the, um, the client, um, again, assess whether they are well enough to start, look at them, look at the, uh, ask them a few questions again to make sure they're okay. Um, don't let them get into the car, keep two, mister, two meter distance from them and have a chat. Um, with them just to gauge their well-being um, and if they may have a cough that you didn't notice on the phone call for example so um, question it and if you feel that you know emotionally you feel something is wrong then it is best not to have them in the vehicle and uh, postpone the the session so um don't be it will be an awkward conversation that but i'm afraid you you'll have to stomach that and say look i'm, I'm afraid i have to refuse to to do the session on this occasion and we'll come back to it for their for their own good but you have got to make this assessment as part of your risk assessment you must do this at the start of every session so it needs a phone call prior um, to engage the person to make sure they're okay every single time you're going to see them a phone call prior um, and then when they come out to greet you again outside the vehicle do another verbal and um, assessment where you can actually see whether they are physically well or not. I'm afraid this is this is the new norm now for some considerable time. If you could move on, please, Carly. Yeah. No. Now we're going to talk about um, PPE, the, prefer, the personal protective equipment. Yeah, that one person made a good suggestion um, in terms of mitigating risk. Uh, try and meet the pupil uh, in their home, at their home address, rather than in public areas where there's liable, obviously, to be more human traffic and more infection risk. That might be a way of uh, mitigating risk. Yes, but don't enter the home. I mean, if you need to wash your hands, you cannot enter their home to wash your hands. So you have to make sure that, um, yeah, great, meet them at home. Um, so there is less people around. That's that's fine. But uh, um, you, that, you have to do what is best for you for the geographical location you are in. It's going to be different for different people, uh, horses for courses, as it were. So PPE. Hand sanitizer is going to be a must. It is quite difficult to get hold of. If you can't get hold of hand sanitizer, it is that there has been um, mutings from the government that um, a mixture of mild disinfectant and soap uh, mixed with water could be used. Uh, again, you've got to make sure you don't put your hands in your mouth, though, or whatever. But if you're going to wash your hands and dry your hands and put gloves on, that would suffice um, instead of hand sanitizer if it's not available. You'd have to be careful about putting that mixture on any of the dashboard or anything else in the car because it could actually mark it and stain it. You would need to try that first in, in the absence of, of uh, sanitising wipes, etc. Um, if you can't wash hands and you'd need to meet the pupil at a place where hands can be washed, in which case you may need to be in some sort of public area, um, you'd have to choose where that would be. Uh, again, taking the risk of how many other people there are around you. Clean your hands as frequently as you can with the sanitizer or whatever. Anything that you use in terms of discarded materials must be put into a bin and discarded as soon as possible. Uh, I wouldn't leave it in the car to the end of the day. If you can get rid of, rid of, rid of it at the end of each session, then do so. And uh, make sure that you, whenever you, you throw the stuff away you throw the whole bag away and don't just empty the bag out and put the bag back in the car again next um next slide please 
And somebody's just asked about, and I'm just replying to you because I know that's why you, you can hear my annoying typing, um, uh, about temperature checks and are you allowed to do them? Um, you are allowed to do them if people give you permission. So you need to seek permission in every instance because, you know, it is their you know, private liberty and, and private person. Um, clearly, do not make contact if you are going to do this and they give you permission with the pupil with anything other than the thermometer itself. You should use the type of thermometer where you can change the uh, the guides that they get the kind of head on them. So there are uh, thermometers with disposable uh, gauges on them that can be thrown away. You buy them in like packs of 50. Um, you, If you do have to use the temperatures uh, gauges that are not have these disposable uh, things, you need to obviously see that as in the contact point and frequently sanitize that as well. I know that fleets like Ocado have been using temperature checking of, of delegates throughout the, the crisis because obviously they've had to train people and get them on the road yeah they touch the forehead they have a device that just touches the forehead so it does for about a second and that reads the temperature because i work for a card myself um so that's that's a useful system that they use um but of course this can be this can be broached on the telephone call uh, when you uh engage them again and said oh, you know you're gonna if you feel you have to do this then there's when you can get the permission to do it is in the initial telephone call to get things going for the client so they understand what the new norm is going to be. Um, Nick uh, mentions also there are non-contact thermometers. So to do your research on those um, and um, and see what's the best solution for you. We have been asked, Vanda, hello, nice to hear from you, um, about whether we will be supplying PPE. I'm in a tight spot here, guys, because um, if we, sometimes we get accused of providing a service and cashing in on COVID. So that's made me rethink whether we can stock and supply PPE. I'm being offered it all the time by companies. We're evaluating stuff that I don't think people could get as easily. But where I think you can get an easy and ready and cheap supply from places like Amazon, I know the range and people like that do face masks. I don't think it's our bag to supply that. And also, we've got a problem with resourcing here at the moment. We've got less staff in um, to be able to facilitate uh, you know, sending stuff out. But if we find stuff that we know you can't get elsewhere and or is at reasonable pricing and we can do it efficiently, we may stock some PPE in our shop. In fact, I've just been offered um, these kits which actually have the mask, the gloves, and the wipe in them as individual sachets, which I think might be quite useful for pupils, for example, for you to keep spares in the back for your pupils. I think you're probably likely to carry a, a supply of the masks that are sold in 50s in boxes for yourself or bring your own. But you may want to keep, you may want to stipulate to pupils that they've got to wear a mask and the lesson won't go ahead without it. But you will always have those who will forget. So you may want to keep a supply of masks in the car for your pupils as well. You also want to be careful with with uh, face coverings and masks with people that wear glasses because it can make the glasses steam up. And that also uh, is something else that needs to be discussed as well. And you need to be prepared to um, pull over on the side of the road and let them get comfortable, first of all, with the new environment they're driving in with um, a face covering, etc. So there's a, a few things you've got to a bit of fact finding and searching. It's still have to do with this new norm. And DVSA sent out their updated standard operating procedures yesterday. And in that are uh, their guidance on examiners wearing masks and pupils. So I sent that to members yesterday. So have a look at that email for that updated guidance. We'll be taking that updated guidance into our training materials on this subject as well. So, so we'll update those. Can you just go back, McCarty? You've not gone on too far. OK, so um, situation with the uh, PPE. Um, just look at the third bullet point there, the antibac antibacterial wipes and spray. Just going to reiterate, you will need these to clean down the car between and possibly during lessons. Again, if you do not have either, then the lessons should be rearranged. If so, the vehicle's got to be cleaned before a new person gets into the vehicle. And it has to be cleaned really when they leave for you to be able to move that vehicle to your next location. And then it's got to be cleaned again before the next person gets in. So there's a lot of cleaning down that needs to be done in order to keep the vehicle sanitised. And there may be some people sitting there saying, oh, I'm not doing all that. Well, the problem is the, um, the, the, the contact points can harbour a virus for up to 72 hours. So you do need to clean it down in between every single student that you have. 
Um, and this is why it needs clean down and everything that you use to clean down with gets discarded as soon as you possibly can. If you could move on, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry, but people, I know this is going on a lot longer than we anticipated, but obviously this is a big subject. So I understand if you do have to go, but those of you who want to stay on, we will keep rolling for you and we'll still take questions at, at the end as well. We haven't got very many more to do now. I think it's about five more slides. I think it's all there is now. So we're oh, nearly there. I have a value okay. money in terms right. of the slides he gives. All right. So yeah. PPE. Um, we look at disposable gloves, um, try and get the supplies you can. I mean, Carl has mentioned about supplies with us at the moment. Some people do have latex allergies. So if you supply to them, you need, you know, if you supply the gloves, you need to make sure, again, in the phone call, if you insist on supplying a certain type of gloves, then uh, you're going to have to make sure that they don't have an allergy to latex. Um, you need to change the gloves really quite often. Uh, face masks should be reserved for the medical profession. If you're going to get anything at all for face coverings, as we mentioned, they do tend or have a possibility of um, steaming up people's spectacles. Yeah. So you need to be a little wary of that. But face masks now, this is the problem. We need to update this presentation, Howard. Face masks now are increasingly coming into guidance for, for the government's considering whether they're going to issue more guidance on face masks being worn mm. in other countries. I think Spain, for example, is stipulating that people will have to wear a face mask or it's strongly recommended to the population when they go out to shop. So I think we're going to update face mask guidance. Um, the updated standard operating procedures from DVSA yesterday are not saying that examiners have to wear a mask, but they are making it clear that they can in accordance with the health and safety executive advice and that pupils can wear a mask as well. The advice is obviously that it cannot impede the safe operation of the vehicle. Well, nor can any PPE. Um, if you just look just below that on that sl slide, this is wear clothing that's appropriate and covers as much of you as possible, including arms and legs. So you shouldn't be in T-shirts or shorts, et cetera, uh, with no, no, basically no skin showing. Uh, and wash your clothing as soon as you have finished the work for the day. Don't wear the same top or whatever two days on the trot. But it is essential that the PP equipment you choose to wear does not impede you or the pupil's vision or ability to control the vehicle. That's an absolute must. That uh, comes under your, your risk assessment of control of the vehicle um, and controlling the uh, environment. So un under under the um, national driver driver rider and training standards so you have to be particularly careful of that point so if you could move on please yeah all right, all right. so after the session um obviously dis disposing of everything um do not shake the client's hand uh, or make any contact with them at all do not contact do not uh, enter the pupil's home um remind them to wash their hands as soon as they get back into the house um, always agree a drop-off point uh, where you can safely wipe the vehicle down. It might be outside their own home, that's okay, but uh, it might be they say, well, I'd like to go to the town. So, okay, agree a place where you can stop safely to wipe the place, to wipe the whole vehicle down um, for your own dynamic risk assessment of being around the vehicle uh, in, the, uh, in, in the environment of other people being around you as well. And make sure you call the next client to assess their state of well-being to avoid a wasted journey because they, they could have um, uh, become ill since the phone call you made prior. And um, this is a repeatable process every day. This is going to be pretty much the new norm, unfortunately, now. So uh, we've got to start getting used to it. It's what I was saying before. You don't know what you don't know until you realise you don't know it. But unfortunately, we are now introducing you to things that you prob some of the things you probably wouldn't have thought of having to do. But this is what the new norm is going to be. So if you can move on, please. Yeah. So during the lesson, make sure you have got a, a structure to the content. It will be a strange environment. There will be outside risks to the vehicle of other drivers doing things that they, they um, have got into a habit of doing because of the lack of traffic around. Cyclists have been quite, um, have a lot of freedom on the roads and being cycling at the middle of the roads, etc. cetera. Um, they will still have a little bit of time to change their behavior. Pedestrians, especially in country areas, have been uh, able to walk around everywhere with the, the lack of traffic on the road. So it's being a little bit more vigilant in the learning environment 
um, the risk initially when you start going back will be slightly greater until things start to settle down again. Um, so it's, there's, there's that to be careful of. Uh, writing should be done by the ADI, if anything. Don't share writing implements or don't share iPads, etc. as we mentioned before. Avoid directly facing each other when discussing anything. Um, and if you're going to do a demonstration drive, um, you know, they are very important for as a learning tool. You will have to wipe the vehicle down again on the contact points. So, again, it's another wipe down of the vehicle. If you could move on, please. There are other considerations. Um, you will need more time after um, any. Well, we've got a key worker training after any training that you conduct because the, the vehicle needs cleaning down. So where you might normally leave 15, 20 minutes to get to the next client. Uh, you're going to need a lot longer now. So this is why we said you have to build out your charge out times now, the costs of your of your lessons, because you're not going to get seven or eight lessons done in a day. You're probably only going to get four or five at the most in a day now with all of the um, extra little duties you've got to do to keep the vehicle clean. Um, if you're going to go home between uh, sessions, you know, make sure that you are able to wash your hands. Um, I would... If I was back in the car again, I'd be considering every day now ensuring that I stop somewhere for lunch and make sure that I keep my well-being up together and uh, don't try and force lessons in to try and earn income. You've got to keep yourself well because uh, especially if you're harboring people that are at home that are in the at-risk category, uh, you need to be well for them. Um, avoid using using your training vehicle for family members if you possibly can. Um, if you do have another vehicle that can be used for family use, great. Try and let your vehicle air. So if you do work five days a week um, and the weekend, you're not going to use the vehicle, allow the vehicle to air and have nobody use it at all. Give it a damn good clean down at the, as soon as you get home. And again, you'd have to clean it down again before you got into it at the next session. So if you want to move on, please. Now, we're not going to labor on terms and conditions here, but we did mention that the, the terms and conditions will um, possibly need to be slightly altered um, when you go back because of the COVID situation. Um, you have got additional risks of um, the, in the learning environment, uh, the, the situation of people not giving you the standard times that you had originally in your terms and conditions for cancelling lessons, that's probably one of the main things that's going to have to be broached. But obviously, there'll be other things as well that will um, that will have to be spoken about too. So I'll write some um, updated terms and conditions and get my legal advisors to, to check over them. Um, it, it's important to understand right now and and. and, and take this advice to all areas. Sorry if it's grandma telling you to suck eggs here. Um, look at all of your policies in, in, in every area of your life because there will be some exemptions. You're assuming that, you know, certain things might be covered, but there's force majeure in most insurance policies um, that means that the insurer does not necessarily have to pay out for coronavirus-related risk. Um, if getting into new policies after this, you will find that a lot of insurers will specifically exclude uh, anything to do with coronavirus and if they do include it clearly it's going to be uh, at a much higher premium so obviously I'm having to look at all of our PIPL right now and understand where we are with our underwriters and that is any PIPL anybody's policy will have these issues um, and, and just very carefully scrutinize everything but I will look to develop some terms and conditions guidance um, for our members as well. Okay good um, so I won't I won't do much more on the terms and conditions, um, but uh, obviously it's going to have to be a terms and conditions said that if the pupil becomes unwell during the session, what you're going to do if you become unwell before taking them out, so the lessons cancelled, that sort of thing needs to be broached with them. We're so just, you want to move on, please. We're discussing internally as well. Should there be a risk waiver? Uh, that pupils are asked to uh, sign and actually should this have been good practice for the sector anyway those of you who like me take the occasional trip I know it doesn't look like it to the beauticians or the spas and things like that you sometimes when the start of the session be asked to sign a risk waiver regardless now clearly they're duty bound to take every precaution not to harm you uh, and have the right procedures in place and safe operating procedures which is your job too but there's always the element that somebody reacts badly to 
something. So that's why they ask you to, to sign a risk waiver. So you might need to look at guidance on that for driver trainers. Now, that is going to be your responsibility to use a risk waiver. But in, this might be part of our new norm is asking pupils to sign risk waivers when they commence, uh, commence training with us. Okay. okay. If you could move on. Yeah, okay, occupational driving risk. This is really a little bit for people who are fleet trainers um, as well as people that drive the, the train the full license holders. Um, so, so as it says here, not, not all or not all sessions will be for provisional license holders. Um, and so we have to consider that sometimes with this coronavirus has taken place that people may have been promoted who do drive but haven't driven for business before. And therefore, you could be asked to take somebody um, out in a company vehicle uh, where they are not familiar with the vehicle. So you'd have to go through all of the process of vehicle familiarization with these people, as well as allowing them to get used to uh, a way a vehicle handles differently to the to the car that they drive or the motorbike that they ride. So um, it's really a situation of um, being a little bit more um versatile with your training techniques um the the things they'll face is that we mentioned the roads would have been quiet uh before return to work and therefore the volumes have got a lot greater the lorry drivers i live over in essex not far from harwich and the lorry drivers are galloping down the a12 at the moment and the a14 um you know when everyone starts returning to work they're going to start getting a little bit narky that we're on their turf. You know, they've had that road free for all this time and suddenly we've got everyone else back to work and they're there in the holdups when they weren't before. So you're going to get a few narky drivers who are going to have a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of road rage going on. So um, these are the sort of things that need broaching and being considered by the trainer that uh, they may have to look at and um, protect the more vulnerable drivers they've got. Um, and these vulnerable drivers don't know will have to be provisional license holders. They can be people who are not used to driving a type of vehicle or driving a certain size vehicle. They are just as vulnerable. So um, we have to just be aware that the road network has gone through a little bit of um, change and people have got to get back together again. Of course, they're going to be coming back to um, distractions as well. Uh, they might be in debt, grieving. They might have been out of work and just taken on a new job. And some people ahead on the road in the queues that you're driving in, they might be ahead of you and could be just looking around, seeing what shops have opened up and what haven't, what's still closed, what's gone bust, what's where the sales are. So it could be all sorts of distractions that take place on the roads as well. So, um, you know, these are the things that we need to sort of looking at as a new norm while people are trying to settle down. Um, we are, the ex occupational driving risk uh, advice is expanded in the stuff we did for key worker trainers because that was our biggest argument that we're pushing up road risk uh, at this time and that's why people do need training. Um, Highways England, who is a partner that we work with frequently, and also TFL have also reported an increase in accidents per volume of traffic. So yes, there is traffic. Uh, there's not as much traffic, but per volume of traffic, there's been some worrying increases in accidents in some areas. And some of that is to do with people improperly trained because some fleets stopped training altogether. They became, they, they kind of got confused and thought they shouldn't do any training, but actually, you know, advice said that they could do some. But there's a lot of untrained drivers driving vehicles that are unfamiliar to them, which has caused accidents. And you'll see more of that as the traffic volume increases. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to find a two tier, um, a two tier skill base out there for a while where uh, people will rush through their training during the, for, do, during the um, key working time. So there will be some bad behavior on the roads for sure. If you'd like to move on, Carly, please. Yeah. Um, you're going to just quickly touch on vehicle familiarity. Uh, it's you, you yourself as a trainer may have changed, had your car changed whilst you've been on lockdown. So it could be a situation where um, the familiarity has to be um, put across to the, the new vehicle has to be put across to your to your client who used to drive a different vehicle with you so that needs to be done as well um, but we've also got the situation where uh, many organizations they don't quite realize that the driving license on category b can host a, a wider range of vehicles than any other category 
um, or apart from category A as well, of course, but category B, where you've got uh, from um, a small car to a large car to a panel van to a three and a half ton Luton. And um, so it's, it, and they all handle different, especially when they're loaded. So there's all this familiarization that has to be taken into consideration if you're engaged in that type of work. And with um, the base of business shrinking, some people will have their job roles stretched. So where they weren't, where they were probably a warehouseman, they might now be a driver warehouseman or a relief driver. And these sort of people will start coming to the fore that will need training. So vehicle familiarity could be something that will come to the fore when we all go back. If we could move on, please. Shall we skip? I think we're time wise, what we'll do is. Um, I think we should take these out and, put, and do another webinar on occupational driving risk because um, we already included this in our safe protocols of training during COVID-19 because as well as the risk of COVID-19, we recognise the risk was also increased occupational driving going on with people who aren't used to it. So we, but that, and that's going to continue uh, because people will be commuting for work in different ways. So their risk will increase. So if they'd have been like I was 10 years in the city, a regular train user, hardly doing any driving at all, even my leisure time, coming back now, a lot of people are starting to ask about refresher training because they've got a life and haven't driven for a long time. There are people who are going to be asked to drive for work, so not just commuting because you know they're going to be asked to cover sickness, go to multiple locations, all of those things. So I think trainers who haven't done much fleet before will suddenly see that they're getting pupils who are people who are different to what they've normally had. They might have more people looking for training in an occupational sense uh, than ever. And if you're not always doing fleet, you're not necessarily you know, teaching in the same way that you would with a full license holder who's driving for work. So that's, I think, I think we should do another webinar for those who are used to occupational driver training to bring them up to speed as well, Howard. Okay. Well, if you want to move on three slides then, Carly, if you will. Yeah. Here you are. Any questions? That's the one you want. Good. Okay. So what have we got? Um, we've been taking as many as we could during the uh, the process. I know people are seeking clarification and confirmation on what can you get done for by the Rosers. Um, so I'm going to obviously go to National Police Chiefs Council um, about that. Obviously, that will vary from uh, territory to territory in terms of England, Wales and Scotland. Um, previously, the police were fining people, just to reiterate, for non-essential journeys. That obviously in England is not something they can necessarily do anymore because we've, we've taken the limits off journeys. What they might do now is look at having people in the car that aren't from your own household. Um, but I will just check on the guidance of, uh, of that from the, the source that is obviously the police themselves. Um, Regarding wearing a long sleeve jumper or t-shirt, does this not harbour bacteria and then back pass that on to the pupil? I'm not sure the science has actually been telling us that at the moment because this is advice that we've got from both health and safety executive and also from uh, DBSA's own safe operating procedures. I think that is a risk that's going to be there anyway and we can't do anything about because you can't not wear anything in the car. I think they judge the fact that covering the skin is uh, less of a risk than having the skin uncovered, and that's why they uh, had pointed to having long sleeve jumpers and trousers on. Yeah, and it's also uh, the advice there as well is to change the clothing every day. So you don't wear, um, for instance, if you've got logo to tops, you don't wear the same logo top day in, day out. You, you would uh, put it in the wash and change it every single day. At the end of the, at the end of whatever you're doing. If you look at the advice for healthcare workers, they basically are saying drop your drawers at the front door. Um, there's a phrase to conjure with. It's uh, you can have that one for free. Um, but basically, they're advising healthcare workers that when they return home, if they can't change at their place of work, they should put all of their clothes immediately as they get through the door in a pile. Put them in some kind of you know cotton bag or something that can be washed, and put those in the wash with no other clothes as well. So. Again, it's that it's that business bingo words uh, phrase. The new norm. Your new norm is going to be, you know, this these washing, hand washing, clothes washing, cleaning, and that's why time has to be factored in to your days in a much bigger way. And that's it on questions. I I, I have seen your other questions. We just haven't got around to them, unfortunately. Or. I've got to seek further guidance from DVSA. So I'll take the questions away, and Howard will as well, and we'll. Um, 
we'll, we'll, we'll discuss those separately and send you more information. Roger, yes, I'm gonna, we're going to produce those as a different webinar, the Occupational Driver Training. I'm just conscious you've been on a very long time now and you'll need a comfort break and also your lunch. So that's why I just worked up with that bit. But if, if you join the Key Worker Trainer Register, if you're doing Key Worker Training, um, you can, that guidance is in there. I will make the training that is in the key worker register available to members now more widely when we've updated all the training materials so originally our protocols and training advice was in this key worker because we had to just keep it in that universe so it was solely for people doing key worker training and not to encourage people to do other forms of training now as we move to the post lockdown world and more of you return to work we will make that training more widely available. We've just obviously got to make sure we've, we've got it in the right state before we unleash it, as it were. So I think really that is, just checking back to questions for a moment, bear with me as I scroll down to the latest. Um, I think we're kind of there. Uh, disposable seat coverings, um, possibly, but obviously you'd have to, you know, that's another expense in your business, look into the advice on whether they work. On PPE, it's a, a thing I'll also do maybe another piece of advice for separately, um, and Howard will. Um, the issue of screens, we've been asked, I'm being approached by manufacturers to say, what do they need? You know, all these kind of things. What's the insurance risk? Insurers um, initially said they didn't have a problem as long as it didn't impact the performance of the car. But now I'm saying they are a little bit concerned about the ability to take evasive action. So um, hold your horses on going investing in any protective screens because even we're not convinced that the ones that are saying there is a hole in them for you to take evasive action, that A, that actually works in practice comfortably, and B, the hole in some instances in the perspex, the hard ones, would actually have to be quite large and negate the risk mitigation of getting COVID because it would be a big hole in which obviously virus could come through it's an invisible thing it's quite small so you know you have to have a hole in there quick you know big enough to take your arm being able to maneuver quickly in any direction that might actually mean that so can the virus get through it's also another surface if it's um, pvt or perspex it's another surface for the virus to adhere to in your vehicle it's another surface to clean so the question is are they that effective and are just face masks and good hygiene sufficient and not attracting more risk by putting another surface into the car? So, you know, bear with us on that advice. Again, we're, it's an unprecedented crisis and we're finding our way as much as everybody is. We don't claim to have all the answers, but as soon as we can find them, we'll pass them on. I think for now, it's, um, it's time to wrap up. Thank you so much for your attendance, but mostly your patience today for giving us a lot of food for thought and uh, and some more grist to our mill as we produce these these materials for you. Um, and I will come back to you and Howard will with any updates. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, pass on to your colleagues who weren't able to get in despite registering today. That, that we're very, very sorry about the technical problems. The webinar is recorded. It will be on the DIA Academy later this afternoon, if not Monday, because it's a large file, takes some time to upload. Um, so, you know, members and non-members can, can view that on their, uh, online. It's not like we've denied everybody the, the opportunity to, to see this presentation. They will have their opportunity. But we do respect that um, not as many people as, as possible could have got onto the webinar today. We had over a 1,000 uh, people to attempt to register today um, we will look to increase the capacity on our webinars however we have to be cognizant of the fact that it can actually be very hard even with 200 people to deal with the questions and allow people to chat to us and just to, to respond to the chat so it's, it's striking a, tr a tricky balance of allowing as many people as we can but not damaging the quality of the of the experience and for us to be able to respond to people in this way and interact. If you have too many people, we can't interact as much. Anyway, so thank you so much and I wish you all a lovely weekend and stay safe and stay well. Yep, thank you for your time, everybody. I hope it's been informative for you. And if you have any questions that you um, have you think of afterwards, then if you want to contact support at driving.org, We'll answer it as soon as we can. Thank you. Can we just make a plea? Keep the support email just for advice and guidance on your professional role. Anything to do with membership, it's email help at driving.org. And vice versa, 
if it's advice and guidance, don't email help. Help is really just about your DIA membership. Support is about speaking to the uh, the advisors and getting advice and guidance. Just helps us manage the traffic because obviously we're the biggest association in the UK. So we've got the most members of anybody by a long chalk. We're dealing with resource uh, staffing issues in terms of not as many people here to deal with calls or working from home. And we're getting tons of emails and calls. So we're just trying to manage how we can get back to people as quickly as possible. Thanks, guys. Take and care, I'll, then. We'll see you soon. Take care then. Bye-bye.